What's up, Thrallers? Miller. Jim and John. Shred Lord. Nick Rock. Nick. And we are bringing you the long-awaited Pantera ranking. Yes, finally, we are going through all of them, all nine, the Yay. Glamterra ear, years, and everything in between. So much Aquanet. Yeah, and I got into Pantera as a dude in high school. He uh, elbowed me and was like, hey, you would dig this. You like Metallica. You dig this song called Walk. And beyond dig it, I did it. It lit a fire in me to play an instrument, specifically guitar. Went and mowed all the lawns I could, saved up all the money, got myself a knockoff, like a used uh, Strat. Still got it down the basement. Big old crack at the fretboard with a, a new custom 15 watt little padded thing. Joe remembers those little bad boys. The They're push beautiful. Button oh, they were crazy good sound out of those things, but either way, it, it lit a fire under me that uh, stays with me to this day. I still jam every day. I still think about dying when I play. It's just who I am, and it was started with. It's where you come from. Singer, <laughs> 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 ah, ah, clever. clever girl. <laughs> what about you? Uh, Pantera for me. So it actually started right about the time that Far Beyond Driven came out, um, and I was uh, at church, <laughs> of all places. Uh, I was in a van with the pastor's daughter and my buddy Ty and his girlfriend, I can't remember her name. Anyway, we were all chilling in the van and they put on a Pantera cassette tape. Uh, it was Far Beyond Driven. And at the time, I remember I wasn't like immediately taken back by it because I was still getting into heavy music. Uh, and then a couple years later, Rin gave me a cassette tape compilation uh, that had uh, a, a myriad of bands on it, but it had Cemetery Gates and it had Domination on it. And I remember when I heard that breakdown for Domination, I was like, dude, all right. Okay, Pantera. And from right then and there, I got my hands on as much as I could. I, much like these guys, mowed some lawns and shoveled some driveways and did what I could to get a hold of uh, Pantera albums. And I really never stopped listening. At least five of these albums live rent-free in my brain 24-7. For me, it was being a 12, 13-year-old kid who wanted to play lead guitar and be the next Eddie Van Halen. A lot of my heroes were guys who were around long before my generation. What was great about Pantera was they were kind of like the metal band for our generation. Uh, more specifically, Dimebag. Dimebag, uh, you know, I can speak for Miller when I say he's easily one of our favorite guitar players. And what was great about him and someone else I love very dear and they were best friends, Zach Wilde, you know, those guys, those two specifically were kind of like my generation's guitar hero, especially in an era of music where lead guitar was starting to get phased out. And those two guys just kept the torch burning. But I remember reading an interview from Kerry King before that always stood out in my mind as well about how Dimebag had all the great flavors of any lead you wanted to hear. And he was incredibly creative with it, but he always served the song. And that is 100% true. He never sacrificed uh, the song or the band to be a hotshot when he easily could have. But yeah, that's kind of what started my love for Pantera. For me, uh, much like Miller, I had a friend in high school, I believe it was my freshman year, that introduced me to him, and it was Far Beyond Driven as well. And at that point, I had already, like, really kind of jumped into it with Cannibal Corpse because I saw him in fucking Ace Ventura. I was like, what is this? That's literally the heaviest thing I've ever heard. This was different. This was literally the perfect soundtrack to pissed off teenager, which I was only for my entire teenage existence. It just fucking resonated with me and I became a giant fucking fan and uh, definitely mowed some lawns just so I could get my hands on more Pantera albums. Maybe shovel a driveway or two. But yeah, uh, it became like my go-to band of the 90s. I saw them multiple times. I was absolutely obsessed with them. And I've been looking forward to this ranking for a while, so yeah. 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 So let's get into it. Where does Pantera begin? Well, with the Abbott Brothers, of course. It was late 1977, Jerry presented Young Dime with a question. You want a BMX bike or you want one of these? Pointing to a guitar and to quote Dimebag himself, he picked the goddamn bike. A few months later, Vinny comes home with a tuba. Old dad steps in again, says, hey, if you're gonna play an instrument, you're gonna play a real one, and hands him a snare drum. And it was then that actually both brothers, uh, similar to Van Halen's, got into drumming. But Vinny progressed at a, a pretty good rate, shoved his little brother out, said, hey, get one of your own. 
And then uh, around his 12th birthday, he was like, oh, hey, Dad, about that guitar. And uh, he got his little uh, sunburst, Les Paul. And uh, for a while there, he just uh, pretty much just wore it until Vinny said, hey, you gonna stop running around with the guitar and actually play the damn thing? And uh, play it, he did. About a year or two goes by, Vinny's in school with his, his buddies Tommy Bradford, Terry Glaze, they're talking to Vinny. They wanna start a band with Vinny and get things going. Vinny's like, hey, I, I'm bringing my brother. My brother's in the band. They're like, ah, we don't want a kid in the band. Vinny's like, tough shit. So in comes Dime with the lead guitar, and that would be the first iteration of Pantera would be these guys. And going back to the name, a few names that they, they tossed around was Eternity and Gemini were on, on the uh, block. But it was a friend of Vinny's from the marching band that said, hey, Pantera, you should name it that. He was a big car nut and there was an Italian sports car of that name. It wasn't until after the band had decided on Pantera that they learned that it was Spanish for Panther and they went with that god awful cover on uh, <laughs> Metal Magic. More on that later. <laughs> <laughs> they started playing the, the club circuits, hardcore, playing uh, the popular hair metal uh, covers. They were a cover band. They'd flip in a few songs here and there because at uh, Jerry's request, like, hey, if you're going to make it in the business, you got to write some tunes of your own. So they started squeezing some things here and there. Uh, shortly, Tommy left the band. Uh, he didn't last very long. And another mate in Vinny's jazz class, uh, Rex Brown, was brought up as being in there, but Vinny was actually reluctant on it because Rex was like the bad dude. He was like late all the time, he smoked, he drank, and Vinny was like, all right, finally. He said, all right, he can be in the band, but no smoking and no drinking during practice. Rex shows up with pack of smokes and a six pack of beer, and Vinny's like, oh man, what the hell are we getting into? Oh, you were serious. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh God, but well. That yeah. trio would be like a holy trinity of metal, and they didn't even know it. After a few years of playing covers and writing a few originals and fine tuning their playing chops and their drinking chops, they uh, went into the studio to record Metal Magic. And obviously, with Jerry Abbott being uh, very much into country music, that whole scene, he had the studio, Pentago Studios, which I got the chance to visit. It's not a studio now, it's like a just a vacant building on the end of a shitty street. That sucks. But uh, yeah, but that area is cool. Arlington is awesome. I recommend everybody to go there. It's fantastic. They started their own label with Metal Magic, and Jerry named it that because he thought that that's what the boys had. They had Metal Magic in them, so the label was named it, the album was named it, and I have no idea where the fuck they got that album, Mark. <laughs> a coloring book. I don't know. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Some mutant thing. <laughs> Actually, I don't know what is happening. There. I, don't, I don't know either. Honestly, I refer to it as like Tony the Tiger's cousin, Lenny the Puma. <laughs> it's either that or the most swole fucking hairless Rex I've ever fucking seen. I, I, I like to think it's the latter. <laughs> either way, dude, that thing skipped leg day, but... Uh, don't they all? It hit ab day really hard, so much so it grew fucking more <laughs> abs. Like... I don't know whoever drew this did not know how musculature worked, but it's okay because it's timelessly awful. Anatomy is difficult, right? <laughs> how many abs? All the abs. <laughs> yes. Extra abs. 17 abs. Hey, Do man. it. I mean, 48 pack. Dime <laughs> said always crank that shit to 12. That's right. That's true. Extra. And June 10th, they would bring out the album, and it's my number nine. Because it's not, uh, it's it's pretty much the reason for it is it's it's basically just their love of what they were into with Kiss and, and stuff like that, and basically Kiss. It was a lot of Kiss love on this album, and, yes, and there although was. you know the 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 playing is 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 decent, it's it's good. It's it's just kind of like exercisey type stuff. It feels like that, but I mean he's 16 years old at this point. He's only been playing the guitar for like four or five years, so. And pretty damn good for a 16 year old. Yeah, this is also my number nine. This is basically just them giving their best shot at what they think is gonna be hip yet commercial. And songs like Ride My Rocket clearly are- About those fireworks. Are Oh, clearly. Definitely not about penises. <laughs> no, no, no. Not at all. Not in 1983. It shows to me that they've listened to, uh, you know, a lot of Kiss, mm -hmm. uh, 
little Judas Priest, you know, that kind of a vibe. And, and I'm okay with that. It's not anywhere near as heavy as any of the other albums, but that doesn't make it good or bad. It's just, these songs are kind of a little throwaway. They're kind of very generic. Mm-hmm. I had this at number eight. Actually, I, I bumped it up. I bumped it up a number because of how musically sound it was for how young they were. Like, dude, Dime's fucking sixteen years yeah. old, yeah. ripping shreddy solos. Um, I mean, really, I'm gonna be honest. The the worst part about all of this was Terry Glaze. I yeah. How? Why? Well, why? You know, I mean, kids. I mean, I understand, <laughs> but the vocals were fucking terrible. But I mean, really. Anything written by the Abbots, I think, on this record is actually pretty musically sound. Mm-hmm. And and again, for being as young as they were, that gets a bump up, in my opinion. Now, yeah. much yeah. like these guys said, and I'm sure will be said throughout, um, obviously this is nothing in comparison to what would come in later years as far as heavy, great music. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't terrible for that time period. And for what it was. And for what it was. Yeah, so, Rex, Rex was the one that shined on this one the most, I think. Yeah, the, the bass one. The was, bass Rex, was, and, yeah, good. Rex and Dime, dude, yeah. that man. I, actually, I thought Vinny's work yeah. in the early years was pretty solid, too. Vinny is solid. He's been solid drummer from A to B. So. Yep. So, yeah, number eight for me. Wasn't terrible. Uh, we're back down to number nine uh, <laughs> for me. I listened to this album years ago because I remember seeing pictures of Pantera, like the Pantera that I didn't recognize yeah. in a magazine. I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> and uh, lo and behold, they showed their older albums. And uh, years later on the uh, internet, I was able to find them. And I was like, ah, oh, no, no. This is, I mean, all right, they had the glam rock look. There's a little bit of that classic heavy metal, like Judas Priest. I would say a lot of Van Halen worship yes. in there, too. Yep, yep. But uh, the execution, it sounds like a young band that is still trying to figure out their sound. And holy fuck, some of these lyrics. Uh, pretty much, like, every song, Terry was letting you know he's trying to fuck. And uh, he's not subtle <laughs> about it. Sad Lover. It's essentially like him saying, like, listen, lady, if you want love, the best I can offer is I'll fuck you in the butt and tell you to leave. Uh, it's it's so goddamn Classy. fucking cringe. I and know. Will he split an Uber at least? Uh, or this was before Uber. If he's a you can throw down on cab money, though. Yeah. Here's cab, cab Something fare. tells me, you know, <laughs> those pictures of him and those form-fitting zebra print pants. It's like, that's that's a classy guy that would throw down on cab money. I bet you he still has those pants. Uh, that's, maybe. I don't know. It's a distinct possibility. Oh, he has. I'm not going to ask. But yeah, this is like kind of a, a very humble start for uh, this band that would yeah. have a profound effect in my life. But yeah, I mean, they kind of had like a lot of trifectas of like stuff <laughs> that they needed to work on right away, like namely album cover, uh, image and the music itself they needed to you know kind of branch out and find their own sound because this is a lot of worship and tribute but still it's like not the worst thing I've heard. I just have to say the song biggest part of me the vocals yeah. are off key yeah that is yeah. the man and that seems like the song that they wanted to go with like the, to be like a, a hit song a hit ballad it was a <laughs> terrible terrible yeah isn't it weird ballad? listening on these first couple albums listening to Pantera write a ballad yeah I mean, I mean, they have written. Yeah, but they wrote cool ballads yeah, like this. They were, like, yeah, there yeah. were a couple of tracks I liked in here. Like the, I think the title tracks all right and rock out. It's pretty decent, mm-hmm. but yeah, they would get better. I'm gonna leave it at that. And they would still relentlessly gig and tour. They were just on it from then until they stopped. Um, and uh, it was it wouldn't be until the late '90s actually they took a break. But uh, in would be July 27th, '84. Projects in the jungle. Same lineup, Diamond, Daryl, Vinnie Paul, Terry Glaze, Rex Rocker, Jerry Abbott. Uh, I forget what his monic- his, his name was on the the Elder or something like that. So the, yes, L, yeah. the L. The L. The L. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. It would be pretty much more of the same, except Dime just like stepped zoop. it up, <laughs> dialed it Big in. Time. Dude, yeah, this yeah. is like yep. one of the biggest jumps in talent I think I've heard in, in, in any like a year. album, like yeah. a year, in, in like a whole year. <laughs> the leads are so much more crisp, much more thought out. Like mm-hmm. even like the guitar tone sounds better. Like literally, like a little it, chunk to it. Yeah, a little more crunch to it. Dude. If it wasn't yeah. for Terry Glaze's vocals, kind of you know, like uh, ruining it a little bit, I would think that this is a different band because musically it got a lot tighter. Mm-hmm. It's funny because uh, Diamond mentioned in uh, one of the Riffer Madisons years ago um, that he, he would talk to his dad and be like, "Hey, man, I want a little more treble and that, a little more kick on it." 
And, no, you don't need that. You don't need that. And then they would, when he would leave, Vinny would go down there and be like, change that, dude, change that. <laughs> and then he would tweak it. But uh, the tone on here was a lot more chunkiness uh, to it. And it was fuller. And like you said, his playing got just clean, really super clean. He had the technicality still, but he had that like feel to it, that little oomph, that like Texas little groove to it. And you could really really get the groove metal kind of basis kind of in some of the riffing here. It even has that blue light turning red, the little dime <laughs> solo thing is like little eruption, uh, which is really cool. But yeah, his, his playing got cleaner, tighter, crisp, better songs, but I mean, Terry Glaze is still doing his thing and uh, just not doing it basically, which is why it's seven for me. I had this at number six. I thought they really turned it up here. The production is better. The guitars have more crunch to them. Uh, Dime's lead work. Honestly, I'm gonna say some of this lead work in here is probably up there with some of the best lead work he's ever done. A nasty guitar solo, solo in blue light turning red. Mm -hmm. Um, all over tonight. That was their first music video. Was for that. Dude, the the title track, Project from the <laughs> yeah. Jungle. Dude. Yeah, that's a killer. Dude, the, the drum work in there, chuggy guitar. It it was really a great step in the right direction. To be honest, <laughs> Terry Glaze was mentioned to have ear assaulting moronic lyrics, <laughs> which I I agree. Accurate. It, 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 but to be fair, so did. Every heavy, like, of, glam metal know. vocalist. I mean, they were all doing the same thing, right? A lot of this was very comparable to Motley Crue, and that's definitely some moronic, you know, uh, lyrics as well, too. Yep. And some of that uh, criticism may have come later when these people found out, oh, there was a glam pen there, and they're listening to it in, like, early 2000s or something. It's like, it's not going to translate well. <laughs> In my opinion, though, I, I think this was one of the better albums for the glam years, so it's a number six for me. I put this at number eight. To me, it is like a heavier version of the first band came in and Terry forgot that they were changing directions a little bit and wrote his weenie shaking lyrics all <laughs> over this album. But I did like that you start to hear a little bit of, dare I say, thrash and someone just mm -hmm. chugging of the open strings mm -hmm. and just the crispiness of the solid state amp that he used and yeah I, this is cool man it definitely has some gems on here but yeah man terry what can i say about terry that already hasn't been said about afghanistan <laughs> he's bombed out and depleted i i might have something to say about that somehow when they doubled his vocals and made him harmonize he sounded worse yes that is that's probably because they were not in key with each yeah, other no no so two voices not in key I have this at number eight as well, and while I see some musical improvements, a lot of this, you know, it, it kind of feels like just a better version of Metal Magic. Like, this would still kind of fall under maybe, like, second tier hair metal, you know, heavy metal, but the fact that there are improvements, namely Dime. Dime fucking shines on here. Mm -hmm. The logo looks better-ish. The album cover is... Not as bad as Metal Magic. <laughs> you know, uh, there's a lot of, like, again, imagery Maybe stuff steps. in here. Mm -hmm. You know, there's still stuff to be worked on, but I really like the song Out for Blood, uh, Like Fire. I was kind of hoping Killers would be an Iron Maiden cover. It wasn't. Me too, yeah. But it was still mm -hmm. a good song. <laughs> I have to say, like, I like the song Heavy Metal Rules because it's just a generic, you know, yeah. It's like literally every 80s Scorpion song ever. Dude, mm -hmm. I think of all the corny Judas Priest songs, like Parental Guide. Oh, there it is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, that's like pretty those, fucking those close. Kind of, yeah, or um, uh, um, United by Priest, oh, if you've ever that, heard that song. It's very skippable. Very, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that riff was like every 80s ballad yeah. you've ever heard. Yeah. But it's it's pretty much, you know, again, like 80s metal worship and tribute, them still fighting their sound. They're making steps in the right direction, minus, you know, Terry, but he probably did switch to like leopard print for this one so no, and it's he's... hard to weenie shake when those pants are so tight so props to him <laughs> i think what he did is he used a little little bit of a metal v to kind of push the crown of his penis and the s flap of the pants away hmm. so that way he had a little bit of wiggle room so when he flapped it around he could kind of meet a copter and <laughs> <laughs> meet a copter? Meet a, <laughs> meet a copter. I love it. So Terry was an innovator, is what you're saying. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. What he lacked in... It was the meet a copter lacked, that... What he lacked in vocal in. ability he made up for with cop talent. There you go. 
that's that's the reason. The untold reason. You're there you have it, it, folks. There that's you why are. Terry left. He was meter copper and <laughs> someone else. The guy, the rest of the guys were tired of everyone looking at his shaking ass wiener. Daryl was like, it's enough meter copter, man. Well, Had yeah. enough. Don't worry, he distracted them also by wearing a vest with no shirt on and probably covered himself in baby oil. Mm. So, yeah, <laughs> that might might dissuade mm. people from the Metacopter a little bit, probably not. And only a short year later after Metacopter in their way through Texas, Louisiana, playing the club circuit still, they came out with I Am The Night. Same lineup, Metal Magic Records, Jerry's at the helm. And the boys are doing it at Pantego Studios. It's released on vinyl and cassette. So if you see a CD of it, it's a bullshit copy. I think if you see CD copies of any of these, they're, they're definitely boots. Yeah, yes. for sure. And this one, I had at eight. It was behind projects. Uh, the reason I, I thought that while the music behind it, you know, the guitar playing, the bass, everything about it was getting way better, Terry was getting just Worse. Way worse. Uh, at a at a, a steeper decline than they were getting better. So that's why I had to switch them up. It was just at this point for me and the listen, it was like Terry just needed to go, and I wasn't the only one. There was people back then even was like, but uh, we won't uh, we won't spoil anything. Uh, there's another little thing. The Daryl goes to the movies. It's kind of cool. It's it's a little weird. A little wanky. I don't know what the I wonder what the backstory. An interesting of that take on an instrumental. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. It's a lead with. What sounds like monsters. Yeah, monster movie yep. behind it. It's like he was like making music to a movie. Daryl goes to the movies. I thought Come On Eyes could have been something cool with the vocals. Again, the lyrics, just everything about it was was cringe. If they would have had, they could have put any other vocalist that would have been as popular in that time period. It's they probably would, a true just, story. It would have been a killer Arcing song. ropes of glaze. Of a uh, metacopter gone awry <laughs> and someone got hit in the eye. <laughs> I mean, it, okay, and hot and heavy. Take a look at my ice cream cone, baby. Go ahead and take a lick. Can't wait to take you home and beat you with my stick. So he's subtle. He's mm. such a poet. Yes, yeah, right. Gonna I mean, really. Black and blue. That's, that's, it's like, man, maybe it's the, the women abuser that, that maybe they're like, you need to go, man. He's just a gladiator of the glissy, man. Yeah. So that's why I thought of this album. The riffs are awesome. I mean, and I am the knight. The, it would show up in Damage Plan. Those riffs would show yeah. up in Damage Plan. So there's a lot of stuff that he did, I'm sure, on his four track from this time that would show up in, in later stuff, especially reinventing, because a lot of those riffs were old ideas. I had this at number seven. I see, like again, like the small increments of progression, especially musically. Terry Glaze, they tried to fucking put every effect on his voice possible, and uh, it did not help. It did not help. But musically, some of the best stuff they've written. Dude, down below. I literally had to do like a double take. It's like, am I? Did I accidentally switch over to Overkill? Because this is a thrashy fucking banger of a song. It's way better when Phil does it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's probably all these songs would be way better if Phil did them. Sorry, Terry. Onward We Rock, I think, is a pretty good like anthemic song. The riffs, are, I think, are more catchy, more thought out. I like that. I think the Judas Priest vibe kind of pushed out a lot of the hair metal vibe. Again, sorry, Terry, uh, <laughs> but. Like, they were becoming more of a flat-out metal band. Like, there wasn't, like, a lot of, like, just, like, oh, they can be still considered rock or whatever. Like, no, this is getting, you know, heavier and more refined, and they're at least, you know, uh, worshipping, I would say, the bands that would continue to, like, push their sound. But, yeah, I, overall, like, uh, if the, there was a different vocalist on here, I'd probably like this one a lot more. But I do think that this has the best batch of songs in this entire glazed-over era of the band. I did number nine. I actually thought this record was just cheese. It was getting better musically here and there. I really thought that overall the vocals actually killed this record. Dude, the title track is so bad that if I were to play that outside at night, all the dogs in the neighborhood would howl. <laughs> I was going to say someone would just come kick your ass <laughs> to turn it off. <laughs> I personally, when I jammed this, I zoned out until it got to Valhalla. Valhalla is a decent song. Which yeah. is the second yeah. to last song yeah. as well. Yeah. So that shows you how long he's zoned but out. Yeah, like I, I zoned out. <laughs> for quite some time. Um, the last track forever tonight, the leads in there are solid, but I mean overall I just thought the album was cheese. Yeah. So number nine for me, but whatever. I have this at number seven. It once again the, we just keep taking a step. There's not as much of a gap between this one and the previous as the first and the second. But this is basically to me 
their version of the B-sides of Screaming for Vengeance. And yeah. that's cool with me. Definitely the most metal so far. And yeah, there, there definitely needed a change on the vocals because it just wasn't fitting what they were trying no, to do, no. especially as the band kept evolving. So uh, yeah, seven for me. I mean, better album cover. I always notice this in this album cover. It looks like the first A in <laughs> yeah. Pantera is yeah. shoehorned in, like they drew it out and it's like, Pantera? Like, oh fuck, I forgot. It was Squeeze just, it in. We'll stencil <laughs> it in. It's fine. It's fu Look at it. It looks great. By the no way, we're going with magenta. Magenta's the most metal color we could we could do Man. here. The cost of printing was probably, you know, yeah. a little well, high was, back then, and they were wasn't cheap. Yeah, they were like, well, let's just do magenta. Blue costs too much. We'll save money by firing Terry. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, one thing I noticed too on that album was that the bass, there was some parts where the bass tone sounded like an old fucking steam tractor. <laughs> and not in like a cool way, you know, like a really bad way. I didn't really care for the bass tone on this either for my final note. But in 86, Terry couldn't really uh, be in the band. He wanted to do his other thing. What was his own thing? Like selling individual cigarettes to fucking teenagers in a parking lot? <laughs> quarter. Here's a quarter. That's right, I was in oh, Pantera. Okay. So you guys like Lycra? It's very form-fitting. What do you think about meat cockers? <laughs> hey. 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 It's a good thing Baby was not flammable. <laughs> or is it? Terry left to join a band called Lord Tracy. It was already signed. He wanted to go do his own thing and left the boys with uh, no vocalists. They had a few fill-ins after Terry. Uh, Donnie Hart. A friend of Vinny's. He couldn't make the commitment for time, so he couldn't do it. David Peacock couldn't hang night after night. They were gigging all the time, and his voice just couldn't cut it. Uh, Matt Lemuyor from Houston uh, didn't click with the band, they said, and so they were left. And there was actually a, a story they were in El Paso at a gig. They had no singer, and there was like this fan who was really avid, and he had some pipes on him, so Daryl's like, dude, fuck it, let him sing. And he got up there and killed it. And he was, the band was like, all right, cool. I guess you're, you know, you can get with us tomorrow and then we'll see how it goes. The guy was so excited. He went on a 24 hour bender and went to the show, collapsed second song in and was rushed to the hospital. And that was it for him, the unnamed singer. Bravo. Good day and a half run though. Yeah. Fucking legend. Yeah. <laughs> Way to go, man. But Pantera would get around, like I said, in the, the area. They would get over to Louisiana, Shreveport. They would play at a place called Circle in the Square. It was then that uh, the locals were telling Vinny, like, hey man, there's this dude in this band you gotta check out. He's, he's an awesome singer. And those same people were in Razor White's camp going, hey Phil, you gotta check out these dudes from Texas. They're freaking killer. Well, a little bit of time passes and Phil contacts Dime and they talk on the phone for an hour and after that conversation, Vinny calls Dime and says, dude, we got our guy. And that sold the deal. Mm -hmm. Phil was moving to Texas to join the boys in Pantera. And in June 24th, 88, would release Power Metal. And uh, it would be all done by those guys except for Down Below, which they re-recorded with Phil singing on it. And this album would also get them some later, some uh, acclaim in the movies, I guess. Proud to be Loud, which was actually done, uh, written and produced by Mark Ferrari, which was supposed to be on his uh, debut album with Neil. It ended up being on Pantera's album and uh, Donnie Darko is featured in Donnie Darko. It was in a, a MacGyver, TV movie. Well, that makes sense. Fucking and a. Uh, where was it at? Oh, Mighty Ducks. Can't forget that one. <laughs> it was in Mighty Ducks in '94. Quack. Quack. But on uh, the uh, request, I guess, of Mark Ferrari, he got a hold of uh, Gold Mountain Records, which is a sub of Atlantic Records, huh. and said, "Hey, you got to give these guys a shot." And they liked them. They dug them, and they said, "Hey." give us an album. So they went in and made Power Metal and they delivered the album to the uh, the Golden Mountain and they were like, ah, they were expecting Bon Jovi and they got Power Metal. So <laughs> they, uh, they uh, passed it back and said, uh, you ha have the rights, we're good, peace. Uh, it's funny because two years later they would sign with Adco, which is also a sub of Atlantic, but <laughs> you know, whatever. They passed them at that time. And, uh, it, they were definitely not Bon Jovi in this one. Phil came in and just 
wrecked it. And I have it ranked at number six. It, it could be flipped with some of the newer ones, but it is a really strong album, especially for that era. But they were still riding on the glam thing, and they were they were just getting used to the band, and they they had that that turn of thrash metal. You could hear that that's where they were going, and that what makes this album special is that this is like the switch at the halfway, you know, going over over to pump them on to the Cowboys album, which they would do a few years later. Meanwhile, through the last forever, and since Stein was playing, he's been tearing up through these guitar competitions. He's been playing the ML, he played the Randall, he got those at a guitar competition. All right, and a little, uh, like a side note, a little, little fun fact. Dime won the guitar competition in Texas so many times in the 80s that they retired him. They told him he couldn't come anymore <laughs> because he had to give someone else a chance to win. I think it was seven years in a row. He won his Dean, he won his Randall, uh, the RH100 that he was iconic for having for years. Um, that's a killer amp. Mine's right there, it's uh, a little different. And the title track on this rips. It's good riffing, everything. I mean, this, like I said, this whole album is, is pretty good for what it is. The first kind of Phil spoken word part I dug and uh, we'll meet again. Uh, the vocal harmonies, you can tell this dude is on point. The vibrato in his voice, he was able to hit a pitch, keep it there, move it around, play with it, do anything he wanted. He has a, still a fantastic voice. It's aged. Now, uh, it's a lot cleaner now than it was 20 years ago, but uh, back then, man, there was there was very few people able to do what Phil and Samo could do. I had this at number seven. Again, the first album with Phil, it's still cheese, but it's got new cheese. It's less Limburger and more mozzarella. Kicked it up, of course, another notch musically. You can see actually little bits of albums that would come later appear in this album. The guitars are a little bit more thrashy. There's some gallop to them. There's some more dynamics going on. Filled with anthems. <laughs> Proud to be loud. And pussy's tight. I get it. Uh, stupid as fuck, but I get it. Yeah, Down Below, I thought, had kind of an art of shredding feel. Um, again, just better things appearing here, and, and now that Terry's gone, it, it, it's good. I have this at number six. To me, this is the best of the Glamterra era, and that's because the kid came. The kid came along and sounded like fucking Rob Helford. And that was pretty sweet, considering they were playing all this, like, classic speed metal, throwback, you know, Judas Priest-style stuff. Hey, how about somebody who kind of... A, stays in key, and B, sounds like one of the greatest metal vocalists of all time. Check, checkmate. So for what this was, this whole era of music before they really decided to just try to be a much heavier, different style band, I thought this was great. It's basically fucking the epitome for me. So this is the best I feel like this era had to offer me until mm -hmm. we break into the metamorphosis uh -huh. cocoon that would become the new Pantera after this. I actually had this at number five. I I really like this album. You know, it, it has that Judas Priest vibe, but there's that sort of 80s thrash speed metal in there. Like, there's a lot of stuff in there that remind me of, like, Annihilator, Metal Church, even Armored Saint. And Phil sounds fucking fantastic on here. Like, he sounds like an even grittier, kind of sleazier Rob Halford. Like, I totally agree with that. Like, it, it has that whole vibe. I think the hair metal aspect is pretty much just thrown out in favor of just metal, just heavy metal and thrash metal. Like, you do have the anthemic songs that are a little bit more, you know, cheesy, but it's not like hair metal cheesy. It's just like, again, like classic heavy metal cheesy. Songwriting, I think, is top notch. Dime's shreddiness is so fucking prominent on here. I like this. This is like, you know, classic throwback heavy metal. I still get into that. I like hearing new bands do stuff like this. It's a fun album. I mean, I, it toughened up the image maybe a little bit. Still a, a fuck ton of Aquanet there and really tight pants, but that would change. Uh, overall, I think this is kind of an underrated gem in their discography. Like, you know, it might be just overlooked just because it's not where most people start with Pantera, mm -hmm. which is where we're going to get to. But yeah, number five, this is a damn good album. Yeah, it was a solid, the over and out. Hell yeah. There was riff in that. It was like a, this Death little like, off-putting mm -hmm. thing going on. It was cool. I mean, pussy tight though, right? <laughs> Am I mm, right? Yeah. Mm. It makes a guy want to meet a copter. <laughs> <laughs> I meet a copter twice in celebration of this song. 
And the boys would uh, then continue like doing the club circuit, doing the thing, and gaining all this underground popularity. And they had a, a cult following almost. And they had eyes from the labels, but they were just like, they're like uh, checking in every once in a while. Like, hey, how's the, the Pantera? They, they, okay, they're still doing the glam metal. Okay. And thanks to Hurricane Hugo, I guess in '89. Um, Atco Records executive Mark Ross was on his way on a plane to go see another band and Hugo diverted the plane to Dallas and then he called in and talked to Derek Shulman and said hey I'm in Dallas what the hell am I going to do in Dallas I can't go see the band he's like well while you're down there look up a band called Pantera find out where they're playing I know they're playing and they were they were playing at a birthday party at uh, the Fort Worth Disco <coughs> That would be a sweet birthday party. Yeah, Pantera. Yeah. Man, dude, that would be the best birthday. Yeah, the boys kind of got wind of it, and uh, they they knew he was coming, so they were all, like, all prepared and shit. They knew he was there. And like two songs in, he split. And the guys were like, what the fuck, man? So the party was on then. They started just drinking and having fun, and at the end of it, Mark rolls back in, and they're like, ugh, we thought you left. He's like, no, I went out to make a phone call. You guys are signed if you want it. Mark was later quoted as saying, how could you see these guys and not think, holy shit. That's what he was saying on the phone conversation while the boys thought he was just AWOL. But uh, they would get signed to ADCO and go into the studio to make Cowboys From Hell. And this is a big change in everything. Uh, the guys basically were like wanted to drop, they needed to drop the glam thing and just they just wanted to be themselves just come out there and, and jeans and t-shirt or whatever the fuck and jam and just let the music go and let themselves go Vinny was uh, a little reluctant from uh, things I've read and uh, but he, he agreed dropped the spandex and they just went on and it took obviously Cowboys from Hell was one of the things that just lit the world on fire and it, it came out at a good spot a good time right 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 at the right time. There's mm -hmm. nothing more you can say to it. it. It fit in perfectly with the time and it catapulted them, obviously, uh, to legendary status. And this album is, like all these albums from here on out, pretty much every song is mm -hmm. old. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're, it'll get into, like, we're just gonna name off all these songs or whatever, you know? <laughs> uh, this one is my number three. It's one of the albums I go back to all the time. Mm -hmm. Terry Date, I'm a big fan of his production work and stuff. He did this, and he wasn't the original guy that they got either. It was uh, Max Norman, who had done some stuff with Ozzy, but he was, he was signed up to produce the album and everything, but then at the last minute he got a better deal or something happened and he, he bogged out. And so the guys got a hold of Terry Date because they liked what he did with uh, Soundgarden, Overkill, stuff like that so uh went into it and that was like again another thing that like with phil coming in and then with terry date really establishing their sound that sealed the deal with pantera and and their their juggernaut of metal that they would continue through the 90s with but uh yeah this one is number three it's not my favorite pantera album but it's one of my favorite albums of all time i also had this at number three and yeah, this album is one of those, I think it was just aged like a fucking fine wine. There's so many favorite songs in there. They pretty much, you know, pushed in the thrash. It was already kind of there from power metal, but they also threw in this big heavy groove. And that was kind of where thrash was heading. Like it was getting a little bit heavier, a little bit more aggressive. These guys sort of brought in this, you know, tough guy attitude. And now they actually weren't wearing like, you know, tight leather fucking lycra pants and shit. So I was like, all right, no, I believe these guys are tough. This is where I think Dime emerges as a future guitar hero. Could not agree mm -hmm. more. Yep. We yeah. heard the lead work. I mean, the fucking breakdown leads and that stupid, awesome fucking, you know, domination breakdown. The lead on Cemetery Gates. It's one of his best ever mm -hmm. still. But I mean, this still had songs that are just kind of just brash and fucking loaded with attitude like heresy heresy mm -hmm. is possibly a top 10 pantera song for me i love how Primal concrete playfully it opens up and then boom it just goes into those thrashy gallops Primal concrete sledge you were pretty much guaranteed that, to hear that live dude, that break, dude and hearing that live dude when the strobes kicked oh. in for that breakdown it was fucking murder yeah it was woo the art of shredding is exactly fucking that this album flat out whoops ass. Uh, if you have never heard it, why? Why? Where have you been? Listen to it. Where have you been that you haven't heard at least one song? Yeah, of Th Cowboys this is. From Hell? 
Uh, essential you, listening. You, listen you, to Medicine Man is one of my favorites. Oh, I love Medicine Man. But I mean, like, I mean, again, we could all, I, I, yeah, I like we've all off. talked about, we could name off all the songs. This is number two for me, especially as my music ch- tastes have begun to change over the years. Um, I resonate a lot with this album. The thrashiness of this album is amazing. And first off, let's talk about the the hardcore switch from what they sounded like on Power Metal to just two years later when they released a banger of a fucking album. Man, the breakdown on Primal Concrete, so I just do Domination has got to still be one of the heavier songs out there, period. Clash with Reality, Message and Blood, dude. The, Message and the, Blood is bad. Dude, the bridge work in Message and Blood. There's just That's enough it. melody on it, too. I, yeah. Yeah, this record and then is... that weird... <laughs> yes, yeah. they, get, they get stuck in my head all the time. Even it's when so I, chaotic, yeah. but it's like, yeah, it's an earworm. Yeah, I gotta leave something for Shred to say here. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I didn't say much. I could, like, yep. go on a tirade yep. on every damn song. I'm, like, withholding. I also have this at number two. I think a younger me would have put this at number one because from a lead guitar standpoint, I think this is the Taj Mahal for Dimebag, uh, every, pretty much every song has an incredibly memorable solo in it. Mm-hmm. And I think that he went into this record to just play his ass off, and that's exactly what he did. Uh, a song nobody talked about that I absolutely adore is called The Sleep, mm-hmm. and there's a solo in that song that I think might be one of the most underrated Daryl solos ever. It's It's got a million earworms, it gives you goosebumps, and he shreds his balls off. From when I was a kid, first hearing the opening riff to Cowboys From Hell, man, um, it's something that just grabbed you. This is a classic fucking album, and not only is it a classic album, but it's a classic album that has way more than your average classic album mm-hmm, hits. Mm-hmm, like, mm-hmm. once again, it's a long it's a long album, right? Yeah. With a lot of songs, but pretty much everyone on there stands out, and that's very rare to very do. Rare. So, yes. Yes. for that, I think, too, it's a fucking killer album. Mm-hmm. I love it in the sleep, like, this goes with Dimes playing. He was able to, like, hit those really high notes, like, in that solo. He just keeps hitting those notes, and he makes them. Uh, he just makes you want to hear them over and over and over. He's <laughs> just like, how high can this guy go? And he's like, oh. And then years later, here's a whammy. I can go yeah. higher. And like, the control shit. he maintains. Yes. That's that's, yep. that's yeah. the thing that makes it special. Yep. So like, yep. you know, there's a lot of guys that can bend high notes, but like, you know, those strings are heavy. He had total command of the instrument when he would do his squeals, his dives, and all that shit. And again, at this point in the game, he's still a relatively young dude. He's Nobody still, even knows who he is until this album came 23, out. 23, 24 out. years old, playing fucking brilliant. Playing brilliant. real life guitar hero. Yeah. That's, yeah. What, that's what you do, kids. Put down the fake controller guitar. Pick up a real one. All right. And so the band would move on to, of course, this tour that we always talk about them being just juggernauts of touring. And they had like a 287 day stint or something crazy like that during this time between Cowboys and Vulgar. And uh, they came back from their European leg of that tour. And in six weeks, they only demoed three songs, which was uh, kind of abnormal for them because they would demo stuff all the time. But they had three tunes, Regular People, New Level, and No Good Attack the Radical. Those were the only songs that they demoed. They went into the studio with nothing else, just jammed on it. And six weeks later, we're done with Vulgar Display of Power. They didn't hop on a plane and go over and do the uh, Monsters of Rock tour overseas. In February of 92, Vulgar Display of Power would be released, and this is my number four. It almost fell to number five a little bit, just because it was, for me, I, it was, I played it too much, I think. I think yep. that's what it was, I just played it too much. They saw what happened with Metallica and the Black Album and the kind of what the fans were saying about that, and I think it was Daryl that was like, hey man, we gotta, we gotta come out ripping. We gotta come out ripping, we gotta get it. And they did. They went in and they just wanted to make the heaviest damn thing that was out. And and they did. Vulgar is just a juggernaut of an album. It's got a ton of hits on it, and like all of their albums. <laughs> and what got me into it was Walk, No Good, Attack the Radical, I mean, Regular People, all those great solo work in this. The whole album is just the solo is him going off 
and and just doing his own thing. There was a lot of these that just didn't make any sense. They're so chaotic. It's just crazy what he was able to do and still make it musical and make it uh, earwormy. I, I don't know. I could go. I could talk 20 minutes, but <laughs> I gotta let them go. But it was it, it was their first Billboard appearance. It came in at 42, and the vulgar display of power came from The Exorcist. That scene where he, uh, I think it was something to the effect where it was like, if uh, you're the devil, then make these shackles disappear. And, and the devil said that would be far too vulgar a display of power. And that's where they got the name of this. And uh, contrary to some belief, the dude in the album, it wasn't a guy that got punched. Uh, the artist, the dude that took the photo said no, it was a guy who was paid and it was, but the, the guys ran with it and they kept saying over the years like, yeah, we jacked this dude for 20 bucks. <laughs> but <laughs> cool makes story. A better story. Yep. Yeah, for sure. Rolling Stone also ranked this as the 10th greatest metal album of all time. So a few tidbits of uh, history there, but uh, yeah, this album is certainly heavy. Everything on this is heavy. Yeah. I have this at number four as well. Uh, this is notably heavier. They pretty much pushed like all the harder imagery and the tougher lyrics on this one. There's not as much like True Blue singing from Phil. Like he, this is where he sounds like Phil. Like mm -hmm. the Phil that we all know, this is where he came from and it's apparent right away like the opener fucking mouth roar. Like he just sounds way more vicious. I think the term, yeah, the production's more biting. Dimebag's tone on this, like, this is where he like really discovered the tones. Like, yeah, let's get this thing more chunkified. L maybe they were listening to, I don't know, maybe like a little bit of X-Order along the way. There was always that debate, but I like this album. It fell a little bit for me just because I think there are a couple like filler tracks on it, but the songs that I love are songs that I fucking legit love, like Rise, Mouth for War, New Level, uh, By Demons Be Driven might Dude. be one of the heaviest tracks yep. they ever wrote. That breakdown, yep. So that's another fucking riff that lives mm -hmm. rent fucking free in my skull, mm -hmm. full of riffs. Mm -hmm. And you can catch Christian Bale playing that song in the uh, the movie Big Short. He plays a scene where he plays drums, releasing some anger, and by demons be driven, he's doing it. Ba -da 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 -ba. Ba -da 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 -ba. I mean, that's an angry fucking song. Pretty cool. And I have to say, I like the fact that they generated some singles that weren't necessarily like, you know, single-ish. Like Walk, granted, you know, very simplified, straightforward song, but it's an angry, fucking nasty song. It's not like a poppy fucking song. Same thing with Mouth for War and even This Love, which kind of lures you in with like, oh, I'm a, I'm a sweet ballad. Nope, I'm a fucking spiteful breakup song. <laughs> and yeah, it, it's awesome. It's a solid fucking album. I also added it at number four. Ranking the, the, the five Pantera albums, the five staple Pantera albums, at least in my opinion, was extremely difficult to do, as we all have discussed. I mean, it fell a little bit for me just because I don't think in what they have to offer, it just didn't like really stand the test of time as much as some of the other albums did. Not that there's not great songs on here, uh, again, a new level of fucking hostile, this love, really all of them. They're all great all songs, great they're songs. all heavy, it's all wonderful. I don't know if I listen to this album as much as I listen to other albums. But yeah, I mean, By Demons Be Driven, I think is one of the, like Nick said, one of the heaviest things they possibly have done ever in their career. It's a good album. It's number four. There you go. You motherfuckers are oh. smoking crack. This is my number one Pantera album. Vulgar display of power in my eyes, and the reason it's number one is this is finally when Pantera is actually Pantera. Cowboys from Hell is an incredible album too, but the days of really wearing a lot of their influences on their sleeve are gone and they've become their own entity now, and this was really the cementing of that in my eyes. Taking away a little bit of the melody and definitely amped up the aggression. The guitars were as crispy as we've heard them so far, they were tight, and everybody is just aggressive as fuck. The drums were aggressive, the bass was aggressive, the vocal attacks, everything was just super aggressive and heavy. That was the mission of this album. And they came out with about six, seven songs that I can sing in note for note. And that's why I feel like this album really resonated with me now going through this ranking and that's why I have it at number one. So on a re another relenting touring schedule they would go and at this point uh, Phil would have the beginning stages of a back issue, medical back issue that he dealt with for years to come 
and even wrote about it in this album, uh, Far Beyond Driven, which came out number one on the Billboard, beat all the stuff that was out at the time, and uh, beat out Ace of Bass, their album. <laughs> Well, beat them out. I th and I bet they thought they had it in the bag. I know, right? But Didn't see that sign, did you? Yeah. Well, everybody saw Pantera at the top of that list and was like, what? Because Pantera fans came out and bought the record, got in number one. First Grammy nod they got was uh, Best Metal Performance for I'm Broken, which is a song specifically you know, mentioning Phil's problem, Phil dealing with that back issue and stuff like that. And this album is one of the heaviest albums ever made for me um it is just bone crushing from start to finish some cool stories like even in uh slaughtered there's no solo in there and originally there was they were jamming on uh like this really kind of clean thing and and dime sold over it and it was just like he noticed in the room everyone was kind of dragging he's like you know what fuck the solo man he's like skip it let's do this so just showing you what Dime was not about soloing. He was about getting the job done. It was like his big Billy Gibbons kind of influence. There's Easy Top being from Texas as well. Um, just getting the job done and doing what the song needed. If it didn't need a solo, it didn't need it. And uh, that would come up later in, in Trendkill. There's a song on there that um, that has a, a really cool groove part and he was soloing over it. And he was like, nah, man, I ain't feeling it. I ain't feeling it. Just no solo. We're just going to groove on it. So he wasn't above just letting it ride, letting it ride, and what I always get shit for talking, letting it breathe, man, letting it breathe, you gotta let the guitars breathe, man. But Don was the king of that. He knew when to play and when not to play, and going back to his technique, he, what not to play was just as important, or is just as important as what you're playing, because it doesn't matter if you're, you're hitting that, that E note, if every other fucking thing on your guitar is making noise, you didn't cut your damn strings, you got pingy noises there, your bridge is all, you know, he tightened everything up. And then- And, and a pingy bridge is rough. Yeah. And, and he went beyond what was, he started with Vulgar, tightening up that gate on his guitar and really saturating the distortion. His tone is crazy. It's a most one of the most sought after tones. And because I still feel this is one of the heaviest albums ever made, I have it up too and it's still in my top 10 albums all time across any thing. So, number two. Sure. I have this as my number three. I, I do adore this album. However, I still feel a little bit more connected to the previous two. The first half of this album for me is a headbanger and then tracks like Slaughter towards the end kind of recapture my attention. You don't have to have a solo in every song, absolutely not. However, that doesn't mean that you have to dumb down what you're doing, and he never did, of course, but no. there's still excellent lead work throughout here, but I think it was also a thing of the times, right? Just, just to briefly touch back on what you said. It was kind of the thing to do back then. Leads were almost uncool to a certain point. The evilness and the aggression ramped itself up and a little less melody than the previous album, but all in all, it's in the fucking holy trinity, man. This is a headbanger. It will break your neck. I had this at number one. This is my favorite Pantera album. All these songs, whoop ass. There is an incredible amount of aggression on this album and more so than there I think ever was in the rest of Pantera's history, their career, even you know after and before. This is when they were the most like pissed off, in your face, fuck you, nothing else matters. Strength beyond strength, what a way to lead off an album. Um, the earworms and becoming, I could name every song off this record, dude. Fucking throws of rejection. Oh is, my god. Is, yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. I love everything about this album. There's nothing on here that I don't like. All these songs live rent free in my head. I can scat riffs out of this. Yeah. I can use my third. I can play <laughs> Dune. Oh my god. Even oh. even their cover of Planet Caravan. I love it. Yep. Yeah. Well done. Fantastic. I just I love this album. I'm not gonna gush anymore. I'll let Nick fucking. That drum oh my god! Commence the gushing. <laughs> First off, Shred, you're smoking crack. Putting this at three. What the hell? This is number one. And crickety crack is wiggity whack. This know? is prime Pantera. This is the most Pantera that Pantera ever Pantered. It's just flat out disgusting <laughs> from start to finish. It's the most aggressive album probably to crack number mm -hmm. one on a Billboard chart oh, ever. Sure. Like there's there's yeah. nothing on here that screams like very accessible. Even 
with yeah. I'm Broken. It's still a brutal fucking Good single. friends in a bottle of pills. How accessible can that be? You know? it's, a, it's a wonderful bit of poetry. Uh, there's a story uh, it's kind of telegraphed in the title. <laughs> sure. But, I mean, like, hard lines and sunken cheeks. Dude. That might be the most evil Pantera yes. ever sounded. Mm -hmm. My soul for a goat? Done, Phil. I mean... I don't. I think you're trading low. Use my third arm. That might be some of uh, Vinny's most aggressive drum. I agree. Ever. Oh, that, I, I agree. love that drum beat. There's just yep. something so biting and visceral about this album. Like every song, just has bad intentions on the listener's eardrums and possibly you know, personal property. Because this is what I brought up as perfect pissed off teenager music. Like I literally raged in my fucking room. Throwing shit and getting pissed off, and then you know, Tamara came in. What the fuck are you doing? Like, ah, uh, uh, sorry, nothing. <laughs> sorry. sorry, my bad. I can almost hear like Dime in the studio during this. No, we gotta chunk it up, man. We gotta chunk it up. We gotta chunk it up. Crank it up. That guitar tone is ridiculous. Like, I used to, like, when I was playing this to fall asleep at night, because I used to listen to, like, just brutal shit. He plays a lot. If yeah. You've ever met Nick in person. Dude, that opening riff on fucking Strength Beyond Strength is almost a jump scare. Like, mm -hmm. it just comes in immediately and it just detonates in front of you. There's no warning, there's no build up, no intros. And yeah, this album is uh, damn near perfect. And I think it's aged like a fine fucking yep. wine. Yeah. Like, yep. stands up to anything. I still look forward to jamming this one all the fucking time. And yeah, that's why it's my number one. One of the interesting things about his tone, how he got, he would stage his EQs and he would get gain off of his EQs, which gave him a, a unique kind of tone to his rig. Because, like he said, he, he mentioned Kurt from Crowbar a lot in uh, the stuff. You know, interviews and whatnot. They were good buddies, and and it was apparent that Dime looked up to him. And uh, he's like, man, me and Kurt use basically the same fucking rig, but he wires it a completely different way than I do. You know, it was his just the way he did things, from the way he had his shit set up, the way he played his guitar. It was completely unique. You know, that dude was just unique as hell. It's after this album going forward, that um, Phil was still battling with things and. I think more of it was probably just wanted to stay busy to keep his mind off of everything going on with his back. He started all these other projects and, and whatnot going on, and uh, Dime was always very supportive of that. He actually got down going uh, back then when that album came out, which was Killer, another album that's uh, on top of my list. It was obvious in these times that the problems Phil was having with uh, dealing with what he had going on was affecting the band. They weren't even together anymore and weren't jamming. The guys were like kind of stagnant and you know, Dimes used to go and man, get your pull. Yeah, they didn't even record at the same studio. And, yeah, yeah. And so they were a little disjointed from it and then wanted something to feel more at home so they brought the studio to his house. And he said that at one interview, it was, uh, I don't know if it was in a, a magazine or, or a, a video interview, but he said it's like, it's, it's really hard to get your dick hard on a song and then get you know, you're in a car for 45 minutes and then wait for your band to show up and then everyone's sticking around. And he's like, it was just total nonsense. He's like, so just bring the studio to the house. And they demoed their stuff there at the house and they loved it. It was kick ass. And so they just built the studio there, got a little 48 track thing set up there. Dime had recording stuff via you know, the four track with him all the time. On this album, Trend Kill, he went back to his old head, the RH100 head, and, and didn't use the Century on this one, which is, because this guitar tone on this album is even unique for Pantera. And it was purely because of laziness. His shit, his live rig was somewhere else, and he didn't feel like going down again. it, so he went and got his old shit out of the garage or wherever he had it, and plugged it in and did the demos with that. And he was so happy with the demos that they just he just kept it. He's like, because he said, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So he kept the amp there. And uh, later in the studio, they were having trouble. He still wasn't getting that sound he wanted. Basically, he got a little four channel mixer. They got four different mics on the cab. And then they blended those signals into the mixer and then went from the mixer to the board. So they were like pre-mixing the guitars down and it was pretty unique. And it was something that it, is used to this day and uh, widely used amongst producers everywhere. And one of the many reasons why I have Trend Kill at number one, even though at this time they were a little disjointed, it wasn't recorded together, the guys had their thing going, like I said, with Dime, Studio, 
and Phil recorded the vocals elsewhere. The reason I think this is the album that encompasses Pantera as a whole is because it does exactly that. You have songs on there that touch on ballad moments and, and lighter stuff, and you have some of the most aggressive, fastest stuff uh, in the, the first 10 seconds of it. Originally, why I put the album down, I heard this way when I was a young Todd, probably when it first came out, and I wasn't into that stuff at that point, and, and it was just like, ah, he's screaming at me, and I was like, put it down. Had I known that it would become my favorite thing ever, I, I would have kept it. I would have just not returned it to the library. And I, was <laughs> I even got, I even got uh, the six song sampler that they, uh, they sent out to, uh, oh, get it up here close, sent out to radio stations. One of the things that drive this album really is the disjointed nature of the way the band was at that point. There was a lot of frustration from all ends for different reasons. And from the boys' standpoint, I, I mean the Rex, Dime, and Vinny, they were frustrated because they didn't have their man. You know, they want to jam with their fucking singer and, and get this shit going and get, you know, get keep the ball rolling. They got a good thing going. And they were frustrated in that. Phil's frustrated with the people and, and everything coming into him and, and dealing with these, these pressures and pain or whatever he's going through. He's angry on a different level. And that comes across in his lyrics on a lot of these songs. And uh, I mean, that's why I th I, this is my favorite. It, it, it's even they didn't like this album or, or good. They, they don't have very good memories of it. And I think they channeled that aggression, whatever they had into the, the music separately, which is why it makes a great album. I had this at number two. I actually bought this album the day it came out. This was the first album by Pantera I ever bought the day it came out. And I absolutely love it. It's dark and moody, but it's also super aggressive. So you gotta get that cool balance. Like, you know, the dirty vibes of like tens, floods, suicide note part one versus like the flat out hostility of Suicide Note Part 2, which is just pure fuck you up, like one of the heaviest yes. songs they ever fucking wrote, or War Nerve, which, my just, God, every fucking riff in that song is so goddamn good. That's the song I test stereo systems out. I've mentioned that before, that War Nerve. It's fucking crushing, and, and it is definitely like sort of a window into the period they're at. Like, Phil's lyrics are very personal. They're very dark. Like, there's mm. still the pissed off social commentary that he has, like 13 Steps to Nowhere, but like when you really like get into the lyrics on like, you know, Tens and fucking Suicide Note Part 1, yeah, dude, it's it's dark. But, prove you tried again. Yeah, dude, it's uh, fucking, it, it's a really solid album. It's just, I don't know, like it, it's a very moody listen and I like kind of the diversity on the tracks on it. It makes for a standout fucking album. I had this at number three. Again, take these fucking five albums and put them really in any order, except, you know, number one being what it was. I like some songs on this album, but not all of them. And I like the fact that it's moody and a little disjointed, but it almost feels a little mismatched at times to me, too. Not a big deal. Drag the Waters, obviously, is an awesome fucking song. Um, I just gotta say it because it's my favorite, dude. Floods, I think, is the best, one of the best songs they've ever written. Um, and the guitar solo on that always just kind of just grabs me dude it, it's very emotional and especially you know later years later it would still be just uh, probably my favorite solo that dime's ever written i love suicide note part two oh. uh, part one's cool too in its own right but dude right. the heaviness overall of that song just leaves everything in its waste um but yeah number three for me i'll shut the fuck up so you can at least say something <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going to be the controversial guy here. Um, I have this at number five. The disjointedness of this album was very apparent to me. And while there is some great songs on here, it definitely does not hold my attention the way that the others before it do. Tens and Floods are some of the most beautiful solos mm -hmm. that Daryl's ever done. The riffs, the pocket, the singing, everything on this is, you know, up to par. It just comes down to what they created this time. And while there's great songs on here, it just wasn't enough to hold my attention the way that the others in front of it did. So, there it is. Yeah. And I have like a special connection with this one too, because this is where I first got to see them live. 
Like they toured on this one yeah. pretty extensively. Mm -hmm. And yeah, dude, that, I mean, I was already in love with their albums, seeing them live. That was yeah. special. Like when you saw Floods on those snare hits, oh, that's where you felt oh, the pyrotechnics yeah. roast your yeah, fucking dude, face. Right, right. And we, I remember when I saw it, we were pretty far in the back. It was at the sports yeah. arena. Yeah. We were pretty far in the back, dude. Yeah, but those so pyro, weird. dude, I could feel it all the dude, way back. Yeah, there. I kept wow. checking to make sure my eyebrows were still fucking <laughs> there. <laughs> all right, and during this time, big break, the biggest break between albums we got, there was a lot going on. They released the official live. They got another Grammy nod. Uh, their fourth nod. I didn't cover the two of the other ones, which were from uh, Far Beyond Driven and uh, Great Southern Trend Kill. Suicide Note Part One got nominated for Best Mode Performance. So, the uh, official live, the live version of Cemetery Gates got a nod. They didn't win any of them, unfortunately. But in uh, most magazines, they just—it was just a clean sweep every year. Uh, Metal Edge one year they the. They won every category. Best Band of the Year, Album of the Year, Song of the Year, Bassist of the Year, Guitarist of the Year, Drummer of the Year. I mean, so all of no these albums. No favoritism album, there. Yeah. None. And it would be uh, kind of the beginning of the end, I guess, because they didn't really jam together much. Phil was doing a lot of other side projects. And drums. And drums. Yeah, unfortunately. And uh, it was this time that... Uh, a lot of heroin. Yeah, they were going pretty stir crazy with stuff, and uh, this reinventing the steel came out, and it's really just a, f a love letter to the fans. They knew the fans wanted some, we wanted some, and they wanted to give it to us, and that's what it was. It was a lot of even Dime went on to say it was a lot of older riffs that he had, ideas he had floating around. But uh, there's a lot of gems on here. I, I have it at five. And it would have been maybe four, switched with Vulgar even, but uh, I still love this album. It's God, Goddamn Electric is killer song. Yesterday Don't Mean Shit, I love that one. It doesn't. It doesn't mean shit, all right? Yes, it's yesterday, not shit. Yeah. They just kept going and gave us what, what we wanted, another Pantera album, and it didn't disappoint. I remember skipping school and, and getting that and uh, listening Fair. to it all day. We just drove around and jammed it and loved every second of it. That's back when you had the Pantera truck. No. Nope. No, it's not. I was in my <laughs> buddy Joe's Mustang, mm. convertible Mustang. We went and got the record and just drove around Mustang and jammed it all day. It was a great memory. This is number five for me, too. I didn't have a Mustang. I still don't have a Mustang. I have an HHR. It's irrelevant. I think this record is kind of what you said. They released it just to, you know, because the fans wanted something. In my opinion, I think this record felt a little bit rushed and a little bit uninspired. And by a little bit uninspired, I would definitely say, like, probably pretty uninspired. It did have a few killer songs, uh, Goddamn Electric. Dude, it makes them disappear as, again, a heavy banger that I've always really loved. But as far as Pantera Records overall, this isn't something that I switch back to on a normal base. There's only a few things that caught my eye, and it, it's not bad, dude. None of, at least from Cowboys on, none of it's bad. It just, to me, just kind of was a little bit lackluster. Just kind of, it was there. And, you know, it's still great. Just wasn't my favorite. So, number five. I had this at number six. And yeah, I know, like this one, like I've, I've always had sort of an issue with because it literally sounds like a band falling apart. Yes. Like it's very uneven. There's some really good songs. There's some songs I think they're just definitely kind of filler, like You've Got to Belong to It, which the, has the that the irritating whammy, whammy in there. Yeah, like yeah, it, it's, yeah. it's just ear bleeding. Like I, I want to like that song, but it drives me nuts. Uplift, Death Rattle, like they're just kind of like okay songs. Like it feels like it's like a diet version of Pantera in general. Like, it just feels, I don't know, just eh, like there's some calories missing that I really, really would have wanted. There's some great songs though, Makes Them Disappear, of course, uh, Outcast of Shadow, and uh, Revolution is My Name. It's, it, that's awesome. probably yep. one of my favorites on the album still. I got to see them on this tour too, and you know, nice. it was, I don't know, like you could just definitely tell that they eh, weren't all together. I mean, they put on a great show. Great show. Like, I don't know. I mean, you could still. I think you could still even tell at the shows. The the last time I saw them, it was what February something, two thousand. I think it was yeah. in the sports arena. They played with Morbid Angel yep. and Soulfly. Badass show. 
But you could tell even Pantera then was like, you could tell that it was kind of nearing the end. Yeah. Because Phil wasn't yeah. really Phil at that point. And you could and tell they were kind of tiptoeing around him, like, you know, like walking on eggshells or something around him. And even the way they interacted on stage was kind of yeah. Eh, there there like, were a fair amount of Phil rants that you know dude, it, yeah uh, uh, yeah it, it, in hindsight very cringy actually pretty cringy at the time honestly my favorite song from this entire era like this entire session was Avoid the Light which only made it on the Dragon yeah, the Two Thousand <laughs> soundtrack fantastic song amazing song honestly yeah. it was the best one in there everyone felt really inspired I love the fucking melodies mm-hmm, on it mm-hmm. but yeah like. Uh, I like this album still. It's just I don't know. Like I, I feel like there was a lot left on the table, and uh, yeah, I don't know. It's just still kind of a slight sore spot for me. Here I put go. this at number four. I like this album. I like it a lot. While it may have been the end, and some of that played a part in the not so smooth transition of the album, blah blah blah. I still think that songs... First of all, I'll Cast a Shadow is one of my favorite Pantera songs ever. Um, it's an instant adrenaline pumper. Like, mm-hmm. if you need to just beat something or someone to a pulp, that's what I would put on immediately. That's huh. that's a hype-up song for me. Duly noted. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Don't play that around. And, you know, Revolution is my name, another great one as well. But this album as a whole, I think has more songs than I like than the Great Southern Trend Kill. And I know that they're going to disagree with me, but that's the beautiful thing about music. And going back to what Miller said earlier, you know, if these were a lot of older ideas, maybe that is why I like them, you know, because they came from a time that was a little bit earlier when I gravitated more with that stuff. So who knows? But regardless, I still find myself listening to a lot of tracks off this album. um, And I put it at number four. And with that album, that would be the last Pantera thing we would get, unfortunately. And, um, yeah, of course, uh, what happened in 04 in December in Columbus. I would have been at that show. We were really talking about going, I remember. It was down yeah. to the all right, It was down to the wire for us. Like, all right, am I going to call off work? Are we going to go? And we said, no, fuck it. They'll be back around. You know, we'll see them again eventually. And that never happened. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was. I've told the story on the channel about you know I was supposed to go and I didn't, and I found out about shit because uh, buddy Chris kicked in my bedroom door because he he because uh, for him I was at the show so I was supposed to go. It was only last minute we switched things around. Um, you know, my brother had something set up that we were gonna get to meet him because he worked at a radio station. So uh, yeah, my buddy kicked in my fucking door, literally kicked in my door, and. Uh, He's oh god, thank god you're all right. It still stings. Yeah, it's a big fucking open wound. Mm -hmm. You know, now when I hear floods, you know, now it it really it it makes me emotional because I'm like, man, fuck, dude. Why? We're talking about it before. Yeah, we're going up on 20 years. Yeah, and we're coming. It doesn't feel like it's been 20 years. No, not at all. And it's more because of the just the guy was so. Freaking cool, you know, and so open to everybody. Charismatic, and he just yeah. loved everybody and everything he was doing, and just wanted to make the best of any situation he was in. He was one of those dudes that wasn't the life of the party. He, like he was the party, <laughs> you know. That was the guy. I mean, go watch the, Dime Vision. You'll exactly, one hundred percent. Go watch Pantera Three. You know? <laughs> any yeah. of the Pantera yep. movies. Yep. Don't fall asleep at that house. <laughs> <laughs> if he has Roman candles, yeah. which. Spoiler alert, he's got Roman candles. <laughs> he always has Roman candles. Even the hockey team, Dallas Stars, they, they grew to love hockey and love, they love the Stars. They even did their opening, their their theme song, uh, when they come out on ice. It's it's Dime, Vinny, Rex, tearing it up. And uh, the team, when they won the Stanley Cup in 99, they were so excited that they wanted, they wanted Dime and Vinny to see the Cup so bad, so they literally brought the fucking Stanley Cup to the two times house because the team wanted to show them they were they, like it, it was it was just it was an amazing person and of course a few years later 2018 of course we lose Vinnie Paul it was a, a giant like kick in the face you know like man we lose Dime now we lose Vinnie we we've, we've lost the, the you know the founding members of Pantera how fucking shitty is that mm-hmm. but uh the, you went out to their graves right yeah, I went down to Dallas, and I even shot a little thing for our Patreons. Um, 
And uh, yeah, it was pretty cool at the Pantego Studios. Well, I saw the table where they signed their first deal because they did it at Campo Verde. That was Dime's spot. Talked to the staff there, the waiter. He was that always like waited on him. I sat at his normal spot, which isn't where they signed the deal, their first deal, but it's a circle table right up in the bar area. Uh, sat there, did a black tooth, and uh, man, it's a great time. And we're gonna get down there. I told him we were gonna come down at some point. If I can talk Nick into doing a road trip, get down there. Fly. Yeah. We'll visit Campo Verde, the sites, maybe hook up with Frozen Soul down there. Those boys, Astyonix is down there, ripping it too. Last but not least, I'm sure you're wondering where the uh, fifth thrower is. We've got the, the four of us here, but we're missing Arin. Um, Rin is on uh, a hiatus, pretty much an indefinite hiatus at this point. We love Rin. Rin, we love you. The door is always open to you. You are always more than welcome back here at Thralls um, and in our lives, but Rin is uh, on his own path right now. So he's doing some shit. He's got yep, some shit going on. Doing some shit. He's got some shit going on. So, um, you know, we wanted to kind of officially announce so that no one really wondered where he was. Rin is not with us. Here at Thralls, he is alive and well, but uh, he is not here at Thralls. He's on an indefinite hiatus, and uh, you know we wish him well. And sir, you are quite welcome back anytime you wish. I just want to put that out there. And well, one more thing, and this ranking, we didn't know that this would happen at yeah. the time we were going to do this, but lo and behold, Pantera. And it's debatable whether or not you know you call it Pantera. Pantera. It's a celebration. Yep, Pantera. celebration of has reunited and are going to do shows. Now they brought on, you know, of course, Zach Wilde because that's literally the perfect person to I, have on I guitar. I couldn't agree more, dude. And mm -hmm. Charlie Bonani. And that's yeah. literally the perfect guy to have on yep. drums. Yep. Not only super talented musicians, but also damn good friends of the band themselves. And of course, Phil and Rex. And they're gonna get together and do some Pantera songs. Fucking Pantera. And I think it's, I, I personally support it. I think it's a fucking, I, I can't wait. I'm I cannot excited. wait either, and I think the coolest thing, and Josh can geek out with me on this, they have Dime's actual old yep. guitar Great tech back. coming yep. to Using basically be shit. an advisor to Zach yep. on how to get that Dime tone and use Dime's gear to get that effect. So that, that sign seals and delivers it. Zach has always been, so, I mean, Look at Zach's career. Zach's His whole career has been He's stepping into it. the shoes of giants before him, and he and never it. And, yeah. he, and he kills it by because he's so respectful. And mm -hmm. let's be honest, him and Dime were like best friends. Yeah. So, I mean, not only is he one of the most kick-ass guitar players alive still, he's also one of the best friends of this guy, and he he's going to pull it off. He's going to do it justice. Charlie's yeah. going to do it justice. And don't think of it as a reunion. Think of it as a celebration, yeah, man. Yeah. Because yeah, there's yeah. a lot of people that have never, you know, will never get to see the the real Pantera live. And this Those is going to be a yeah. continuation and a celebration of an amazing band. And you're going to get a better Phil. Um, you're going to get Phil kind of uh, all put back together. Yeah, he may not be able to hit those high notes anymore, but who gives a fuck? He's still Phil. Um, he's Never still Phil. the kid. Yeah, he's still Phil, and he's in probably, the, the A, the best shape and the best mood I think he's ever been in. Mm -hmm. So it should definitely be a, a sight to behold. And, yeah, like these guys said, you know, a, a lot of kids never got to see that. A lot of adults never got to see that. Mm -hmm. And I, I think these songs, you know... Why why kill it off if you don't have to? You know, especially if you're gonna put a tribute band together and put Zach in Dime's place, which they talked about for fucking ever, and I, I think would be the, the best way to go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And actually to solidify the whole Zach and Dime thing, I have this. It's just a cool piece. So this was signed by Dime six months uh, before that shit. And it was signed by Zach. Uh, six months after. Let me try and get without the glare. There you go. <laughs> yeah, so one of the uh, my prized possessions really in this. Uh, so I'm all for it. I'm all for the yep. the, the uh, tribute. We're gonna go see it. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm gonna go to as many shows as I can. I'm I'm on the fence about it because I, I saw Pantera, and honestly, mm -hmm. it may never be as good as that. So there's like be. this, again, there's like this <laughs> thing, and I know like, you know, Phil's PR stuff has not been the best, but honestly, I, I do think he's legitimately like changed his tune on a lot of stuff, because 
Yeah, I, I did see a lot of the Pantera Phil rants when I did see Pantera. Yeah, yeah it was some, some it was, it was, it was yeah, he, yeah, he said some shit. Yep, mm -hmm. yep. But I'm I'm all for them doing this. Like, you know, people I think jump the gun and say, oh, they're going to try to record again and do a new album. But no, they're not. They're yeah. not. Don't think that because that's not happened. This is pretty much, again, just a tribute. To, and in closing, basically, we're all huge fans, obviously. there's We're not alone in this. Mm -hmm. And uh, you should be, too. You should dig into this stuff. Even go back to the glam stuff. It's not all good. But it's still things that they did, they recorded, they put out, and they were proud of when they did it. And it's worth checking out. A few wrap-up items. We got uh, Mastodon ranking coming up next. The boy, Jamie John, will held that up. We have Patreon. If uh, you want to give us a like, subscribe, all that stuff, that also helps us out as well. You can go to thrallsofmetal.com. We got some cool shirts up there. We're going to have some other stuff. We got some shorts working. and uh, Grenades. Some hats. We're getting some designs down on a hat. Um, and sent away, so we'll see. Hopefully the supply chain issues are not going to hurt that too much, and we'll have those up on the site pretty soon. So yeah, good things in store. And it's all because of you guys. Thank you so much. We're getting uh, we're getting up there in subs. So <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. It's, it's yeah, awesome. It's, uh, it's awesome. It's nutty. And yeah. we're going to keep it going. Keep this ball moving. Keep the trainer rolling. For all my buddies here, I'm Miller, and we are the Thralls of Metal.